Hai sai gusio, hajimiti ya sai, wanne erika yai bin. Welcome to Icharibo Chode, a podcast featuring Okinawan voices and stories, episode 2. In this podcast, we aim to create an open and safe learning and growing space where the three of us will explore alongside guest speakers what it means to be Shimanchu. Our intention and prayer for this project is to cultivate our own knowledge about our histories, celebrate the amazingly diverse and resilient culture of our people, inspire other Shimanchu of all generations and geographic locations to be curious about their histories, and to preserve those precious pieces of our identity for our future generations. And of course, to have fun along the way. We'll laugh, we'll cry, we'll stumble around and be human. We hope you'll come and join us for this evolving journey together. We're looking forward to it. Yuta Sarukutu, Unege Sabira. Welcome to episode two of Ichari Bachode podcast. I'm here with Erika Kunihisa. I say gusuyo. Hey everyone. And our very first guest speaker to the Ichari Bachode podcast, Brandon Fugusku Ng. Brandon is a fourth generation Okinawan, father, son, teacher, musician, and language revitalizationist, and generally an awesome human being. Creative mind and inspiration behind Let's Sing Uchi Naguchi, intended for younger audiences, and more recently creates music using only Uchi Naguchi, with the intention of bringing awareness and to spark interest in the Okinawan language. And most recently, he released a YouTube channel called Let's Speak Uchi Naguchi. Um, Brandon, it's so lovely to welcome you here today. I think the first time that I saw you was live at the Uchina 1000 this past year, where you did your Chiko Shokai or a self introduction in maybe four or five different languages. Um, perhaps you could share that with our listeners. <laughs> All right. Hi, Sai, everybody. Um, thank you for having me on, on your podcast. It's great to be here and um, to connect with you, uh, both of you. I guess live, right? Instead of just just <laughs> on social media. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess to to talk about uh, that self introduction that I did, um, you know, I I didn't realize till later in my life that um, I'm really fascinated by languages, um, and it seems seems like in in some well for some languages I kind of grab onto them a little easier. I guess like everybody else. Um, but I did spend time in Okinawa from 2009 to 2014. And um, at that time is when I learned to speak Japanese because uh, um, that's pretty much the, the common language that would be spoken in Okinawa today. Um, and so actually I did take Japanese language all throughout high school and a couple semesters in college. And I had a, had a pretty easy time with it. Um, the thing is, I never actually used it until I went to Okinawa. Hmm. When I first got there, I, I realized I, I didn't know how to use it, even though I could, you know, uh, taking tests on paper and stuff like that, it was, it was fine. But um, having to actually survive um, using the language um, was a different story, right? Hmm. Um, you know, but just spending time in Okinawa um, as a student 
I first went to Okinawa on a study program, and I went to the art university in Okinawa to study Ryukyu Koten Ongaku, so the classical Ryukyu in mu- music, mostly Sanshin, of course. Mm. Um, and just through taking those classes, you know, trying to communicate with everybody, um, I picked up Japanese. Um, and then while I was there, is when I also started learning or trying to learn Uchinaguchi, which um, wasn't too easy because there weren't a lot of places that you could learn it. Yeah, and even if you did, to be able to use it outside of those classes wherever you were learning, it was hard to find people to practice it with. Um, but you know, I bought a lot of books. I did find um, groups here and there to study with, um, and. <laughs> I guess in my maybe second or third year there. Um, okay, let me back up. So the first year I was there, I met a lot of um, Okinawans from South America because a mm. lot of them um, were on that same program. Mm. So especially from Argentina, Peru, and Brazil that mm. year. Um, but the longer I spent there, um, I think, well, again, I think it was my second year. I decided, well, let me, well, one of my friends from Brazil was having this Port- Portuguese like circle at DQ, uh, was it DQ Daigaku? Yeah, so I'd catch the bus, you know, once a week and go sit in on this Portuguese study group. So I, you know, I picked up some greetings. I, I never really um, spent enough time to really uh, pick, pick up the language, but just some simple things um, I was able to pick up on. Fast forward to, I guess, my second to the last year, I met my my wife, who's mm-hmm. Okinawan, born and raised in Argentina. No. Um, and so actually, after leaving Okinawa, I, had, I was very fortunate. I had the opportunity to go and spend time in Argentina. And I was able to, um, I guess you could say I picked up Spanish. It's, it's still really, it's still not good, <laughs> but... Um, I, I can kind of communicate in Spanish, so that that's where the Spanish came from. That's awesome. Um, um, and that was, I think that was the, the extent of the languages I used. <laughs> that's <laughs> that's a lot. In like, uh, <laughs> such a small, or like maybe two or three years time, you picked up like four different languages. I mean, even if it's <laughs> like, not like a lot, but that's still very impressive to, you know, retain yeah. that. <laughs> Mm. the the program that you were there on brandon was that the Uh kempi program yeah that was the kempi program so i i was supposed to come back home after one year Mm. so i i mean i did come back home after the one year um but maybe a few weeks later i went back to okinawa because i I found (laughs) a job so yeah so yeah so i spent the rest of my time there teaching english oh okay yeah and so that's the job that you came back for after yeah yeah cool that's so awesome yeah thanks for being here brandon i i think i'm um me and mariko are both really excited to have you (laughs) on here and i think this is the first time we're kind of meeting face to face um Mm -hmm. as much as we can given the pandemic but i think a lot of my conversations with you have been um corrections which i'm very thankful for (laughs) for teaching me the proper (laughs) use of like since um this is so very new to me and i am just very grateful for all the work that you've done over the past almost 10 years i want to say i think almost about eight years or so which i think is amazing because i think um it really just shows like the generation to generation or just like people to people in terms of being inspired by what has come before and how we can pass that information mm-hmm. down to the next person or next generation and stuff. So I'm just really, it's really cool just to be able to talk to you about further more about like language revitalization and just your journey to, to be here and stuff. Yeah. No, oh, no, thank you. Thank you again. Um, I always enjoy sharing my, my journey so (laughs) yeah it's so awesome um but yeah i know you already briefly went into your story of like you going to okinawa and kind of studying different languages but um is there anything else that you want to go into in terms of like how you like kind of connected to your 
Okinawan or Ryukyu roots and stuff. Okay. Um, so for me, it started off when I, from as young as I can remember, just because um, I've only known my, my Okinawan grandparents, my Okinawan grandparents. So on my dad's side, I'm Chinese. My mom's side, I'm Okinawan. <clears throat> and um, yeah, from the time, again, as, as way back as I can remember, when we would show up to my grandparents' house, uh, my grandpa would be sitting on the floor practicing his sanshin. And he only played the classical Okinawan music, the, the slow stuff you know, that a lot of people would have a hard time getting into. Um, mm. Now, the thing is, as soon as we'd get there, you know, we walk in the door and then he'd finish, you know, that last line he was singing and then he'd put everything away. So we never really got to hear him play, you know, a full song, I guess. But mm. the music, um, you know, even just the image of, of the instrument was always, always there. My grandma also did Okinawan dance. So, mm. um, again, because of that, you know, we we're pretty familiar with how the music sounded. Um, at some at some time, you know, for family reunion, I remember they had they they taught us a couple of dances, and we had to, um, you know, we had to learn Okinawan dance. Um, and we had always been told, my grandparents always told, always told us. When I say us, I mean talking about my sister and I, mm-hmm. I have an older sister. Mm-hmm. Um, so we always knew that we were Okinawan and we knew that it wasn't Japanese, but you know, even then we, we didn't really know what that meant. Um, Cause that's all we were really told. Uh, well, I guess we, you know, my grandma would tell us stories of, of um, being discriminated against, um, mm. you know, even in Hawaii. Mm. So again, we, we knew there was some kind of history of, of not getting along. Um, with the Japanese community in Hawaii. <clears throat> but still, we, you know, if someone asks, okay, what's the difference between Japanese and Okinawan? At that time, I probably wouldn't have been able to really say anything. Um, and I guess it wasn't until I was in college, you know, in my early 20s, um, at the University of Hawaii, there, there was a, a, a Sanshin class. It was a one credit elective course. Um, so I decided to take it. And I really only took it because um, because I had been learning guitar for a while. Mm. And, you know, the sunshine has strings and um, I was into music. And I thought, well, why don't I try this, try to learn this instrument that my grandpa used to play. Um, so I took the, the class and then... Um, the the teacher of that class, I ended up taking lessons with him after <clears throat> after the semester ended too. Um, so he he really kind of guided me in that direction to to um, really think more about um, you know the deeper meaning of of the culture and um, and even the history because because of that, I think I got more involved. Um, you know, like I attended an Irei no Hi observance in mm-hmm. in Hawaii. And that was the first time. So again, I was in my my early mid twenties, and it's the first time I heard about the Battle of Okinawa. Um, mm. You know, and there were pictures, there were displays. Mm. You know, this typhoon of steel image, and um, you know, so it, it was kind of a gradual thing for me. But all these, I guess, all these building blocks, you know, started coming together, um, and um, eventually. Um, yeah, eventually I decided, well, that would be really cool if I could spend time in Okinawa. Um, I heard about the, the Kempi scholarship program, um, because of, through a friend, a friend, one of my friends had a friend who was there and so he recommended I apply for it and I did. Um, and yeah, that really kind of helped, um, push, push me. You know, to to explore my roots more, um, and could I share if I could share one more thing? I guess yeah, the, please, in this time period, please. in this time period that um, so um, as Erica mentioned, there is a 
you know, there's a huge Okinawan community in Hawaii, right? But even then, there's a lot of people outside of that community and even within probably who they don't um, really recognize the difference between Okinawans and Japanese. Mm -hmm. um, so even some of my close friends, you know, they just think I'm, they just think, oh, Okinawans are so proud. They just have a lot of pride. That's why <laughs> they say they're Okinawan. And, you know, even though I, even if you try to explain it to them, they, you know, they either tune out or they just forget right after you tell them. Mm -hmm. um, but there's one instance when I was in college at the University of Hawaii. Mm -hmm. um, um, so I used to work part time on campus and one of, um, one of the manage one of my supervisors, he was from Japan. Um, nice guy. I mean, w I consider him a friend. But one day I, I was wearing um, a silicone wristband um, mm. that said mm -hmm. Uchinan True Pride. I think it said Uchinan True Pride. Yeah. And I had gotten it from one of the Okinawan festivals. Mm. And um, he saw that bracelet, that wristband, and he asked me, what does Uchinan True mean? Um mm. So again, you know, in my mind, I I know that Okinawans are different from Japanese, but I don't really know what the difference is because I know, okay, now mm -hmm. Okinawa is politically a part of Japan now. So, and mm. I'm pretty sure they speak Japanese there, right? So here's a Japanese guy asking me, what does Uchinanshu mean? So I guess, you know, in my mind, I was kind of thinking, how come he doesn't know what this word is? Like, mm. he speaks Japanese, you know, because at that time, I didn't even realize that Hmm. Okinawan language was its own thing. Um, uh, so when I told him, well, I, Okina, uh, Uchinanshu means, you're, means an Okinawan person. And he told me, he, he said, no, that word doesn't exist. Like, there's no such word as Uchinanshu. Hmm. Um, and I was, wow. he told me, I've heard of Uminchu, you know, because Uminchu is that, that mm -hmm. brand of, of T-shirts, right? And <laughs> you're by in Okinawa. I mean, uminchu is in an actual Okinawan word, but um, anyway, when he yeah, when he told me that that this word doesn't exist, you know, it's like he's telling me that my yeah, he's trying yeah. to erase my identity. He's telling me that wow. my my grandparents all this time they've been telling mm -hmm. us for uchinanshu and and all of our family, like we don't exist. Wow. Um, and so I was shocked, you know, because. First of all, he didn't know the word. And second of all, he's telling me it doesn't <laughs> exist. Um, but again, at that time, I was just kind of like, oh, this is this is weird. It, it wasn't, mm -hmm. um, I wasn't like devastated or anything, you know. Mm -hmm. But it made me realize, okay, well, something's up here. You know, right. how, come, how come I can't explain, you know, this this word? And how come, uh. you know, how can, how come I cannot argue back? Like, I don't have any evidence. I don't, you know. Mm -hmm. So that kind of, when I think about it now, um, I think that's another thing that kind of pushed me to, um, to really feel like, okay, I gotta, mm -hmm. I gotta know this stuff. I gotta know my roots if I'm gonna identify. You know, especially uh, if people aren't gonna believe me. You know, I have to, I have uh, to back it up. <laughs> yeah, so. that really resonates with me. I don't know if it's like a Hawaii thing, but also, mm -hmm. I grew up with like knowing that Okina, being Okinawan and being Japanese mm. was different, but the history of it wasn't taught to me, or I mm. don't know if it's even taught like within the Okinawan community in Hawaii. And mm -hmm. so kind of the same with you, like we'd always be like, Uchinanshu pride. And, you know, mm -hmm. you get some people like the Japanese, same things like, no, it's yeah, different, yeah. but I can't, you know, <laughs> argue yeah. with you why it's different, but I know it's mm -hmm. different. My, my yeah. family tells me it's true. Then I believe it. Mm. And I think kind of like you, Brandon, where I didn't really learn the history till like maybe about six years ago, where, you know, it's kind of a similar history as Hawaii with the annexation mm. and whatnot. Yeah. And I kind of like understood that, but I didn't really understand the implications of like assimilation, colonization and stuff till like last mm -hmm. year, basically. So mm -hmm. okay. yeah, everything has been just like shifting for me in terms of like, whoa, what does this mean? And why wasn't this explained to me like before and yeah. just all this unpacking and stuff, but yeah. Yeah. But yeah, that your story kind of also just resonates with me a lot. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So thank you for sharing that. Oh. Mm. 
Yeah. I just want to echo just how I'm so glad you're like, can I share one more thing? And like, (laughs) that was probably one of the most profound sharings that I've heard in a while. Like the, the complete erasure of like the, the non-acknowledgement of that Mm -hmm. word, like Mm -hmm. of an identity is just so intense and indicative of the problem, you know, (laughs) and, 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 uh, you know, I, 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 while that has never had, I, you know, I've never experienced that like firsthand. I think there's like a lot of like sort of embedded micro stuff that is erasing of the Okinawa and stuff. And I, I guess I haven't really had like a very like, you know, I mean, for me, that was like a showstopper where I was like, oh my God, that's not okay. You know, mm-hmm. um, I haven't had that, but listening to your story, I just, I mm-hmm. loved that your your introduction to to the Okinawan um, revitalization, like the, the thing that got you into it was actually the Sanshin, you know, mm-hmm. but it was this teacher yeah. that's that said, hey, this is the gift of your um, your people, you know, and like, and so, and, and, and now, you know, the, like, through this like very triggering and harmful sort of interaction with this Japanese person, um, you know, has blossomed into this, you know, has has set you on your path towards learning more about your language, about yourself, your culture, your identity, and has springboarded you into this like incredible um, <laughs> offering of like music and um, you know, this like these YouTube channels, like you know. And I I shared this earlier, but you know, like I I I found your YouTube channel and I was like, you know, here I am in Vermont, like listening to it in my little car while I'm commuting to work and like singing along like Quachisabita, Quachisabita, like, you know, and anyway, I, um, I'm sort of rambling at this point, but I'd love for you to speak. Um, I don't know, maybe that's a good segue into, um, inspirations for, um, you know, like the, the whole let's sing Uchinaguchi and like your, your own music and your passion Mm -hmm. and how you're taking that, um, you know, that sort of, that intense moment and how you're bringing it forward and like sort of the hopes and the dreams, the pivot towards the positive. And yeah, yeah, yeah. I just love to hear about that. Okay. Um, yeah. So I've, I've played music for a long time. Um, I started, I guess, you know, I was in the band in, in intermediate school and high school. Um, started playing guitar, maybe ninth grade. I had never, I've tried, I had tried to write music before, but it, you know, nothing ever really kind of felt like it was something worth holding on to. Um, and I guess thinking about it now, the Let's Sing Uchi Naguchi stuff was kind of the first one for it's like, I really wanted to share it with other people, you know? Um, and kind of the, the story behind that is, um, you know, working in the elementary schools in Okinawa. <clears throat> well, first of all, when I got the job, when I first, got the job at my first school, um, I was hopeful that there would be, you know, um, teachers or, or staff of, of the older generation who, who would be able to um, mm-hmm. teach me Okinawan. Language. The mentors. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, and when I got there, you know, a lot of teachers will tell you, you know, if you're the English teacher, they'll, they'll kind of just, you know, individual one-on-one conversations of like, oh, teach me English. You know, you know, we're so happy to have you here. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, when you have time, teach me some English. And I would often tell them, yeah, of course, you know, but teach me, teach me Okinawan. <laughs> and even the older ones, you know, they a lot of them would would tell me, oh, you know, I can, I can understand Uchinaguchi, but I can't speak it, or I can't speak it well enough to teach you. Hmm. Um, and this is, you know, one school there was one um faculty member who i i had heard her like i heard her conversing in okinawan i mean it's funny because she'd be she's really talkative she would tell a story about something that happened to her with some oba somewhere and then <laughs> and then she would say what she would she would break into she would quote the oba and she would say something fluently in, in uchinaguchi mm. so i'll be like okay oh, hey, there it is <laughs> You know, uh-huh. teach, you know, teach me. And, but same thing. She went, no, 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 no. My my Okinawan is not good. Uh, uh, yeah. You know, um, at first, it you know kind of made me upset. Like how come how come they're they're lying? They're lying to me. But but mm-hmm. then you know when I think about it later, it's um, it was kind of ingrained in in their thinking that 
their language is not something worth passing on and um mm. so you know we can't can't really put the blame on them yeah. right um if you know if possible we've got to figure out a way to to undo that or um but um anyway so again going back to the elementary school setting um i was still trying to learn uchinaguchi on my own um and i had also realized that the kids at the school knew practically nothing of their their own language um or their own i guess ancestral language yeah because they only grew up speaking um and learning japanese um so i used to talk story with the other teachers and i would tell them how in hawaii when i was in elementary school it's different now but um pretty much all the public schools they had to once a week they they had to have like a hawaiian cultural um lesson you know we would learn at the very least songs that teach you colors in hawaiian or, or how to count mm -hmm. um, and then they would you know they would bring in a little bit of culture depending on who the teacher was and i would tell in okinawa i'd share that with them and i would tell those teachers you know it'd be so great if if we could do something like that um with okinawan language and okinawan culture Mm. And the ones that I talked to, they all agreed this would be great, but they all told me that the problem is there's no time for it because the curriculum is so strictly controlled. Mm. Um, and the truth is it's controlled by the Japanese central government, right? Mm. So they have to, you know, um, even the amount of Okinawan culture and history they learn in school is so limited. Mm. Um, a lot of them, they don't find out about their own culture unless they they study abroad and they, they meet mm -hmm. people who know about yeah, looking out for, for right. a lot of them. Um, so, um, yeah, so, Ugh. again, yeah. I'm, I'm still thinking, you know, how can we, what can we do about this or what, what mm -hmm. could I do about this? And um, being the English teacher, you know, I, I was supposed to, I did follow a curriculum that the Board of Education had, had prepared um, and I was supposed to plan with the homeroom teachers because I was the assistant English teacher, right? Uh -huh. so we were supposed to plan classes together, but um, most times they they either didn't, yeah, they just didn't bother to meet with me or they would flake out on our meetings and I would just be left to, to plan <laughs> on my own, which wasn't, a, it wasn't a huge deal because it wasn't really rigorous <laughs> to be honest with <laughs> the curriculum, <laughs> curriculum. But um, I thought, okay, well, if, if you guys are going to let me do what I want, you guys are not going to um, have a say in it. Then, well, I'm, I'm going to bring Okinawan language into the English class. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, um, I love yes. that. Yeah. And, yeah. And then eventually I came up with the idea of, of having songs that, um, you know, introduce simple words, phrases, basic mm -hmm. stuff. Because that's all I knew at the time. Mm -hmm. um, but just explain it through English and then we could do it in the English class. But the cool thing is that the kids loved it, especially with the animation. Mm -hmm. So every, I went to two other schools after that and every school, like every English class, we started off. <laughs> with That's awesome. songs. I love it. <laughs> Sometimes I wouldn't play it because I would get tired of hearing myself. <laughs> but then they'd be like, what happened? What happened to, to the Uchi no Uchi song? Let's, let's do it. <laughs> so, um, I love it. That's like such a rebel move too. <laughs> and I, I'm so curious. Cause like, I, I feel like there's the, um, you know, it's like, Oh, left to your own devices. But I love that you sort of rebelliously brought in like Uchinaguchi mm -hmm. into the, the English class, you know, like, <laughs> wow, what, what an powerful way to, to bridge those two things. And, um, yeah, I'm like, you know, vigilante almost. Like, it's pretty, <laughs> <Trojan horse. laughs> yeah, pretty incredible. So good for you. I, I, you know, I just, um, I know a lot of people that have taught English abroad, you know, and, um, you know, not, and, you know, I have to be careful what I, what I say, but um, I think that it takes a lot of um, guts and um, um, passion honestly, to, to weave something like that in, because they think the easy thing to do is just to do the thing that is easy, <laughs> which is yeah, not right. try too hard, mm -hmm. you know, but instead you chose to weave in 
you know, layers. So it's, it's, it's so thoughtful. And, you know, I think the children, you know, like they loved it and like, I loved it listening to it in my car. And I know it's so catchy. <laughs> yeah. You're probably very tired of it, but we love it. <laughs> I know. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. I have to ask, I, I haven't dived into it yet, but who did the animation for, for your videos? So yeah. um, one of the, the Brazilian Okinawan students that I met my first year in Okinawa, um, he, he was into computer animation and he still does actually. Mm. He has his own company now, but um, so he left Okinawa, but we kept in contact and while he was still there, while we were there on our study program together, he had, um, he had asked me to either create, he asked me to write a song. Did he ask me to write? Or, or he just asked me if, I, if he could borrow some of my music and use it for a couple of his animations. So I did. Um, and so I figured, well, you know, I'm sure he'd be willing to um, do me a favor. You know, so, so I asked him if he could make an animation for it. Um, and he... Was he already there? Because he's in Germany right now. Oh, wow. That's where he, he has his, his animation thing. I, I think he was already in Germany. Um, but when I asked him, he told me he'll animate it, but his, his illustrations, he said they're not, they wouldn't really match. Um, or for him to have to like draw kind of cute characters, <laughs> which mm. is not really his thing. Mm -hmm. He said it'd take him a long time. So he, he contacted one of his friends who is also... Um, in Okinawan, but she she was born and raised in Brazil also, and she was in Brazil. Hmm. So we had this, you know, really international. That's um, so web cool. Of, I love of, that of Okinawans. Um, so he asked her to illustrate, and so all the illustrations are by her. Hmm. Um, and then all the animation, he he put it to the animation. Um, the one thing he did and uh, illustrate, I think, there's one video or at least one video with the goat. I don't know if you've seen. That. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so he 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 illustrated the horns because at first they didn't have horns. <laughs> <laughs> I asked him about it, and I think he's like, okay. I, I'll do that. I'll do that. <laughs> I think when you I brought think it up. Him. You were like, "Where are the horns?" <laughs> yeah, <I was> like, <laughs> the great animation. Where are the horns? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So. Um, I love that little behind the scenes. <laughs> oh, that's trivia. You gotta listen to the Ichani Bachode podcast and then you can find out the juicy details. Yeah. Yeah. That's funny. So you actually started that or at least you started the YouTube channel, let's sing Uchina Gucci back in 2012, which is amazing. It's almost yeah. been ten years since you first started it. Yeah. And it's um, I bet you've like learned a lot throughout the years. Cause I know you've like also helped create um, that Uchina Gucci PDF, uh, I think it's Rika. Oh, yeah. Or, Rika. Yeah. Uchina Ankai. Yeah. yeah. So that's like a really useful resource I've mm -hmm. been using a lot. <laughs> but um, since in, I guess, the time frame um, throughout the years of like learning and teaching, have you um, noticed anything different? Like, um, was the interest for Uchina Gucci like, harder for people to get into like when you first started versus now or mm -hmm. are there any things you're, that you're seeing um recently or anything well um if i could go back to my time in okinawa or actually to to kind of connect to that time i'm really curious now to know um what the climate is like there as far as people being interested in the language because hmm. when i left it was um it was pretty minimal i think um, How long that ago last was year, that? so that was 2014. Sorry. 2014, okay, yeah. Um, that last year, right at the end of the school year, the Board of Education they they rolled out these, they were more like guidebooks, they weren't really textbooks, they're these little pamphlets, hmm. um, actually not that little, but um, with Uchinaguchi phrases greetings stuff you could use in school like when how to how to say mm. let's play this game let's you know mm. or invite someone to play um and they they made copies for enough to give to all the students oh wow and um when i saw it of course i got really excited and some of the teachers passed it out but one teacher gave me theirs he said, oh here i know you like i know you're really into okinawan language so mm. you want a copy i said yeah you know i was really excited but then they told me, um, 
yeah, because I'm not going to use it. Oh. I'm, I don't. I don't think oh. I'm going to pass out. I was like, wait, wait. <laughs> um, so yeah, the, there was there's a really wide range of of response to that, um, and again, mm. you know, trying to find classes to learn while I was there. They were they were out there, but um, it wasn't very easy to find. Um, so I yeah, I'm curious how it is now. I've somebody I spoke to recently would told me kind of bluntly, and no, it's, it hasn't changed. Um, but I would think I would think maybe there's a little bit of of mm-hmm. of a increase in interest. I don't know. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, but outside of um, outside of Okinawa, especially, you know, since everything went virtual last year, mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. as I, I kind of mentioned in that when I shared my first Let's Speak Uchinaguchi video, there does seem to be a big um, uh, rise in interest um, about the language. And um, again, thanks to the internet, there's a lot of, there's a lot of sources out there. Mm-hmm. Um, and... Um, you know, to be honest, there are some that are, that I, um, how do I say it? <laughs> <laughs> There's some, some sources that I feel are more, more trustworthy than others. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Which, um, just as you're speaking here for our listeners, what, what, where would you send somebody that is looking to learn? Um, you know, like where do you, where would you direct somebody that's learning for the first time? For the first time. Um, yeah. Well, if, if they're okay with just um, kind of self study and and kind of reading stuff, you know, I'd, I'd refer them to the Dika Uchinankai, which is available online um, in a PDF file, because um, that gives you know starts off with self introductions and greetings and um, um, you know more recently on YouTube there there's a a channel there's a guy he's also from Hawaii. And he's been sharing a lot of background information on Uchinaguchi, you know, mm. like talking about the different, well, <clears throat> for example, um, the the different languages within the Ryukyu island chain. Um, trying to think what else, but again, a lot of a lot of background information, and um, I think the idea is he's going to start also sharing more videos on the language itself, like cool. actual language lessons, yeah. Cool, cool. Um, so yeah. a lot of good information on that. Um, again, I've also started my Let's Speak Uchinaguchi mm-hmm. channel. Mm-hmm. So um, the idea is to kind of just go through some of the phrases that I that are in the songs. Yeah, so um, kind of break those songs apart and and get into a little bit details about those phrases. So um, so those videos they probably won't be like a a step by step. Okay, start from from zero and you know, mm-hmm. self-introduction, greetings, and all this kind of stuff. Um, but I do plan to, um, you know, throw in all these little side notes about the language and pronunciation. And um, But again, you know, that these are limited to my, <laughs> what I'm, I guess, my ability, right? Because I'm not a native mm-hmm. speaker, so sometimes mm-hmm. my intonation might be a little bit off mm-hmm. or um, um, things like that. Mm-hmm. But... Um, you know, at the same time, for people who just want to hear it, because mm-hmm. some people just want to hear what the language sounds mm-hmm. like. Absolutely. There's a lot of, um, there's a few, well, I shouldn't say a lot. There's a few channels on YouTube that they'll, um, they have recordings of um, Uchina Shibai. Mm-hmm. These are, um, a, lot of, a lot of them are comedic plays. There's singing, there's dancing. So the good thing about those is that you hear the language spoken because there's dialogue, but then, in the singing and dancing parts, you get used to, you get to hear traditional Okinawan melodies. Hmm. So, um, when I, when I watch those, like I can hum along with, with all the songs because they're very familiar. Um, Mm. and it only makes me think, you know, back then when this was a normal thing of entertainment for people to, to go and watch, they also were very familiar with those melodies. You know, I, I'm pretty sure if you played some of those songs for someone from Okinawa mm-hmm. now in their twenties or or younger, they would probably it'd probably be the first time they've heard mm-hmm. those melodies, you know. Yeah, uh, it's interesting how um, I I often f- think about um, 
music or, you know, art or something like that as being a vehicle for transcending um, time and generations. Uh, my grandfather also used to play Sanchin. Um, and I've recently like been asking my mom just because of like curiosity and that kind of thing. And I've been getting clips, like little bits of like, you know, these precious little morsels of, of information and history. And mm -hmm. I just love the idea of um, even just thinking about, you know, people that are in their 20s or something like that, that might not necessarily mm -hmm. know it, but, you know, maybe someday they stumble on a YouTube, at, like to one yeah. of the sources that you found, and then they get on this, you know, and they follow that thread. And then yeah. suddenly there's that revitalization piece, um, which, you know, I've been, um, I was so grateful to, to find your, so you have a band camp Camp, and you have a song and um, called Shima Kutaba Kutuba. I don't know if I'm mm. saying that correctly, but <laughs> sorry. But oh no, no. Um, and I'd love to. I, there was like a beautiful passage that you had also written um, around sort of the mother language and losing mm. that. And I'd love mm -hmm. to hear a little bit more about what that is, and um, you know, how are you addressing some of that revitalization through your music? Because again, mm. it's such a like a vehicle, a transporter for, um, you know, moving people's hearts and mm -hmm. um, towards reconnecting with that. Yeah. Um, okay. So, so the the proverb that um, I shared with that song. So I, I kind of worked it into the chorus. I I modified it a little bit, but um, kind of the traditional proverb says, "Marijima no kutuba wa shine kunin wa shiun," and um, so Marijima talks about um, well it's literally like the birthplace but you know you could think of it as like the homeland as, as sometimes we might um, refer to um, to a place where our ancestors came from but um, basically saying if you forget the language of your homeland then it's like forgetting the homeland itself so the words that they use a little bit different they say um, so if you forget the language of your homeland then they say kunin so by using by using the word kuni, it's saying you also forget the country that you came from. So that's that's kind of a, a cool thing that, you know, you can think, well, they're acknowledging that, um, yeah, it was a separate country before. It was its own country, its own mm. history, its own language and culture. Um, but, um, you know, I, I think it's not only the physical space that gets forgotten, right? Because because the homeland is where your ancestors came from. So if that's forgotten, then um, your ancestors are also forgotten. And there's actually, so some people actually tack on an extra phrase. So, Marijima no kutuba wa shine kunin wa shiun. Kuni wa shine uyang wa shiun. So that addition there is, yeah, if you forget the homeland, then you forget your your parents is what it says. Uya, uyang wa shiun. Um, but, you know, uya can also mean not only parents, but those that came before you. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I guess throughout my time doing what I've been doing, I slowly kind of put things together myself as I'm doing it. And mm -hmm. um, when I think about it now, you know, yeah, one of the reasons I'm doing this is, again, to honor my ancestors, as that phrase was brought up earlier mm -hmm. today. Um the ancestors, you know, my my own parents, my grandparents, because again, it was my grandparents who who basically taught us that we're Okinawan, right? Even though we didn't um, really know the details, so it's kind of honoring them, even you know, as as mm -hmm. as recent as as my grandparents or my parents, um, you know, pass or trying to hold on to the language because you know that's also who we are, right? It's part of our identity and our culture. I love that so much. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think that that last piece that you added there too, I just it it makes me think about like um, <laughs> spirituality, religion, and you know the the Shinto animism of Okinawa and mm -hmm. how much of that is, you know, ancestors and honoring your ancestors and, and, and to some, like basically synonymously say, like, if you forget your home country, it, like you're forgetting your ancestors, like you, you've lost your connection to, yeah. to the earth, to who you are. And mm -hmm. that just feels so profound to me. And um, I, I feel that like 
deeply <laughs> in myself mm-hmm. right now, um, especially as, um, you know, an Okinawan person who's not in Okinawa, you know, and I think of like the diaspora, I think of, you know, like I have a nephew who's turning one next week, you know, and he's a quarter mm-hmm. Okinawan and just imagining all of those, those people that by blood, by ancestry, they are these powerful, proud people, you know, with this deep culture and connection and, um, but may not have that tie like it's up to the people that are here currently to be able to make that connection strong and solid and um but yeah i just anyway i think i'm just a little emotional because my little my brother's baby is turning one and i can't believe that's happening it was really fast (laughs) (laughs) yeah i'm like i'm an auntie i'm an oba (laughs) I'm going to be an old <laughs> I'm too young. <laughs> but no, that, that really like actually um, because that happened during the pandemic, I think it also inspired me even more to be like, I mean, I had that curiosity for myself around my own identity. And then I realized like, whoa, this is like way bigger than me. It's like going from that like infantile, like selfish, like view of like, oh, this is who I am to like, oh no, like there's like other people like in this chain of this lineage that need, need these things. And if the link that we are, you know, I am, if that doesn't happen, then, then something's going to get lost. And so anyway, just like a lot of respect for, for what you're doing and, um, Thank you. yeah. Um, so I, <laughs> I'm just following along here, but, um, do you have hopes of starting your own school ever? <laughs> I know you've, you've taught, you've, <laughs> um, you put out all of these incredible resources. What does that, what does that look like mm. for you? <laughs> <laughs> I had I never, um, thought much about that, about starting a school of my own. Um, Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, actually, when I was in Okinawa, um, some of my friends, they started a group that um, kind of the end goal was to to start a Okinawan immersion school, like a mm. language immersion school. Mm-hmm. Um, and they were, they had kind of taken inspiration from from the Hawaiian immersion schools that have popped up here. Amazing. Um, so it started off as just kind of like a once a week after school kind of thing. Um, but unfortunately there was not a lot of where there wasn't enough interest that um they could really take off um they had they had resources they had people who were willing to teach um but the kids that came were pretty much only the kids of the the people in the group and maybe some of their um, nieces and nephews do you Um, mind if i ask a a question here was this in okinawa yeah oh yeah this was in okinawa Yeah. yeah Wow. Um, too. So it never took off. They they eventually had to, um, yeah. They they stopped at some point. Um, that's so sad. That's like no. that's so sad. Why do yeah. you why do you think that is? Um, so I recently listened to a podcast that talked about mm. the the schools. I, I had no idea that the schools in Hawaii that were making progress to, mm. to, you know, revitalize the language. And mm. um, I was like, I wonder if anything Okinawan like exists. So it sounds like there was mm. even efforts made, but why do you think that was not received so well? Um, well, I think, I think in general, people don't put, that much importance on the language unfortunately in okinawa um again now i th- it might be different there might be more um more drive to to do something about the language but <clears throat> especially at that time um again because after school you know um people are busy uh, kids have sports um unfortunately you hear a lot of people's um i have friends who um I guess they're around my age or even a little, little younger. They'll express interest in learning Okinawan language and their families are just talking about friends from Okinawa. Mm. And their families will say, you know, there's there's no sense. Why you want to learn Okinawa? And they're, you know, wow. you're not gonna, it's not wow. going to help you get a better job. It's not going to... Um, yeah, um, I've heard the same sentiments from, from yeah. other people. Yeah. And then, really of course, it's like, why don't you learn English? Like, why don't you just focus on English? Mm. You know, it's kind of like this outward um, view, you know, like there's no need to, to 
to preserve Okinawan Gosh. stuff. We should, yeah. I feel like that's such a deeply like col- colonized perspective, mm-hmm. a very Western, like, unless oh, yeah. you can capitalize off of this, then there is no merit, you know, yeah. I, that yeah. just, okay. Yeah. yeah I'm going to take a moment to not go off on that. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's well, I didn't realize that there was like efforts in Okinawa to create like their own immersion school. I guess um, Mm. this was like my question. I was curious if you had any thoughts of um, making like a immersion school, maybe not in Okinawa, but in Hawaii or anything, because I also listened to that um, NPR episode about um, the Hawaiian immersion schools, how uh, I think it was Larry Kimura, his name was, mm. and mm. he taught at UH, but then he also was teaching his students. And then with his students who are still learning, they created the immersion school. And I think this kind of relates back also to like Modi language and some Native mm. American languages. And yeah, I was just curious if that would be something um, we could do with Shimakutuba or like Uchinaguchi kind of thing. Um, because yeah, just the idea of the thought that the importance of learning or preserving Uchinaguchi isn't, they don't, maybe there's a thought that it's not worth it is really, really heartbreaking. Mm -hmm. And Mm -hmm. to be able to like, you know, change people's minds that it is important. And as you're saying again, like if you lose your language, you lose like your connection to your ancestors and stuff. And, Mm -hmm. I know there's like linguists, of course, in, within the Shimanju community who have been learning about language revitalization and studying other cultures and how they're doing it. And I know there's mm-hmm. like a small movement and stuff like that. But but yeah, I would be curious to know if like what else we could do to, you know, yeah. mm-hmm. really um, encourage like other Shimanju to know that this is important and, mm-hmm. and stuff like that. Yeah, <laughs> I wanted the same thing. Um, mm-hmm. yeah. Sorry, I didn't really have a question. It was more of a ramble, but <laughs> <laughs> no, it's not yeah. a ramble. I think, I think that's a really great question, um, Erica. And one of the things that I keep coming back to, and I think we talked about this a little bit in our first episode with Tori, was. Is there something that um, we as people that are not in Okinawa currently are able to do that Okinawans proper have no, like aren't able to access? So Brandon, I think like earlier and earlier you were speaking to the idea of like, you know, Okinawans maybe not having exposure to the culture or like um, their own history even. And so like, I I think a lot about privilege sometimes and, um, you know, as Americans, like having the history, and again, I'm sure we have a, a, a biased version of history as well. Um, but the the history that we've heard might be a little bit different than what, you know, Okinawans have received through their educational system. And it, are there things that we as Americans, I, I'm assuming we're all Americans. Are we Americans? Mm-hmm. Uh, okay. So, you know, like as that, um, that we're able to harness in some way and use as a platform. And I, you know, I think I wonder if maybe the reason why we are so excited about this right now and like that energy that you were talking about, about wanting to learn more about the language and and preserve it, um, you know, is proportionally more because proportionally in the demographic of displaced Okinawans, people that are wanting to connect to their roots, whereas like people that are still in Okinawa might not necessarily even know that that's happening to them. And, yeah, you know, yeah. so I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. If you've got any, <laughs> either of you, <laughs> it's a big question. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, first um, I want to share another proverb that came to mind yes. when, when you mentioned <laughs> about, Okinawans in Okinawa, maybe not noticing. So mm. the proverb says, Kirama miyushi ga machigi, uh, machigi ya mirang. Um, so from, from Okinawa Island, there's a small island group called the Kirama Islands. And mm-hmm. you can see them on a clear day. You can see them from Naha. So it, the, the proverb says, you can see the Kirama Islands, but you can't see your own eyelashes, right? <laughs> so so that's, um, that's what came to mind. But... Um, it's beautiful. Um, this, 
you know, kind of getting back to your question, and this kind of ties into the hopes for the future. Um, you know, I think from the outside looking in, you know, they have the the what is it called the Sekai Uchinansu Taikai um, every five years, and Actually, I think it was the last. Was it the last Taikai? There were people were complaining. Um, well, I don't know if they were complaining, but people were commenting on how they were sad that there was there wasn't um, very much uchinaguchi being used at the Taikai. At all. all the announcements were in Japanese, and all mm-hmm. you know, even the, even the theme song. Um, I've actually sent in submissions um, to. to for the theme song, but I knew it wouldn't get selected because one of the criteria was that it had to be in Japanese, you know. So even, even stuff like that, Whoa. I think th- people are noticing, you know. So um, um, I think if I mean, you know, it take a lot of work, but if if enough of us from the outside can mm-hmm. can you know use our voices and and just you know let Okinawa know how important that language is to connect us. Mm-hmm. Cause I would, yeah, that would be so beautiful if at at some taika in the future people, you know, come back to Okinawa and and people communicate the common language between them is is Okinawan language, right? Mm, um, mm-hmm. that, would, that would be know. so awesome. Yeah, I'm getting like emotional thinking about like, oh, that's <laughs> yeah. so beautiful. Yeah. We could do that. Yeah. Wow. Um, yeah. I'm so glad you shared all of that and um, your story too around that. Like, I think I keep coming back to this idea of erasure and like, what is that? You know, even the fact that the Uchina Taikai, you know, like the criteria was that it needed to be in Japanese. And mm-hmm. and so many of these, um, you know, not necessarily Okinawan, but other indigenous groups that I've um, sort of been following along, um, you know, they have like, English detox, like, you know, they have entire celebrations where they just speak their language, like, you know, and don't use any of the colonizer language at all. And um, I wonder what that would be like. And, you know, is is that yeah. something that we can aspire towards? Say, Erica yeah. Tori and I, we've been talking about um, <laughs> the the 2022, like the um, Taikai in Okinawa for Shimanchu. And um, <laughs> we have aspirations for that. Um, including a karaoke session, um, <laughs> a, a, a live podcast. We have dreams. We have dreams of all being there. We're trying and, to manifest it. Yeah, Brandon, you're coming. You're going to play Sanchi, and it's going to be amazing. <laughs> yep. uh, but yeah, just like, uh, what would that look like to, you know, it's awkward enough to speak English, you know, your your mother tongue, you know, mm. and and, and yeah. what would that be like to get a group of us together to speak yeah. all in Uchinatsu? Yeah. You know, I have um, I have a friend, he's a he's a PhD linguist. Um he's in Okinawa now, but he um and his girlfriend they they both do work to for revitalization also and they have well they didn't do it this year of course or haven't done it for a while but Part of their their study group is they take a small tour to um, I think Kumejima, and they spend like a like one night there. But the requirement is they can only use um, Uchinaguchi. Now in Kumejima, the mm-hmm. the language is a little bit different from Okinawa Island, but um, I think the the pockets of preser- preserved areas are are stronger. So so they go there and they have like this. This camp, this Uchinaguchi camp. Mm, that's um, awesome. That's so cool. I mm-hmm. love it. I'm like invites. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. They they need to sell tickets. <laughs> and I, I love that there are linguists out there, like like you know people that have really studied the language. And mm-hmm. that's not an area that I particularly excel in. I tend to be more of like an immersion learner, and I'll mm-hmm. just have um, you know a beer or two with my good friends my yep. cho day, if you will. And, um, <laughs> and then we'll, we'll have a good time. And, um, but I, I love that there are also people out there that are dedicating their life's work to, yeah. to truly preserving it in a way that is much more scholarly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. 
Well, I think we're starting to close off at the end, but we saved like the most important question for last. Um, what is your go-to karaoke song? <laughs> oh, wow. oh, man. It's um, a very important question. <laughs> it's probably going to be Take On Me. Oh, oh yes. Uh-huh. yes. <laughs> That's a good one. Can't go wrong with all five. Take On Me. <laughs> 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 I, I mean, them, I didn't. I didn't understand what that meant. Go to karaoke song. <laughs> yeah, I didn't yeah. know that was a question. I thought, <laughs> Sorry. Oh, yeah. Yes, no, it's no. very important. <laughs> uh, yeah. No, it's it's great. I I love that. So most Okinawans that I've met are are pretty amazing and par- not party people, but they're just go with the flow <laughs> kind of people and. Um, I love and miss that because I don't have a lot of that in my life here over over in the East Coast. Mm-hmm. Um, there's not a lot of that. There's no karaoke anything. Oh, okay. um, no karaoke. Uh, like, no <laughs> karaoke. Like you say karaoke and it's like, yeah, it's a very <laughs> different image. I will not paint that picture for you. Um, <laughs> it is a disservice to what that is. Um Oh, what I, oh my, I think I shared this the first time, but I'm, I'm going to share it with you also, Brandon. Um, mm-hmm. But one of my favorite moments, so I studied abroad in Nagoya and mainland Japan, and mm-hmm. um, we were the um, Ryugakuse, the exchange students were going to karaoke. And we went into the wrong karaoke room accidentally. And um, there were like, obviously a bunch of Japanese people and um, Mm. they were asking me. And at this point, I actually didn't really know a whole lot about my Okinawan pride, but I knew I was Okinawan. And, you know, they were like, yo, you're Japanese. What kind of Japanese are you? Where are you from? And I said, Okinawa. And there was another Okinawan in the the karaoke room. Yeah. And he started talking to me in Uchinaguchi. He, oh, it was wow. like this amazing thing. And I think, I think that actually might have, for me, been the profound moment, like the, the awakening, if you will, of like mm-hmm. nobody in that room understood what he was saying, including yeah, me, yeah. which was so sad. <laughs> but, but, you know, like I knew like, you know, bits and phrases, but nothing to communicate back to him. And, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. as a, you know, young college student in, in their, in their time. <laughs> <laughs> I just knew that there was like that that kinship, you know, and yeah. um, it it transcended all sorts of things. So shout out to that guy, whoever you were in that karaoke <laughs> box in Nagoya, whatever you were doing, you made an impact. It was fate. Nice. You guys were meant to yeah. meet that night. <laughs> I, wow. I think about it, you know. I think about it, and like you know, to you know, I don't even remember if this was part of our recording from earlier, but you know what you were talking about, Brandon, with your students. Um, I think what you said said to them will will stay with them. Like I think that there are pivotal moments where where it, people realize how important like things are that are external, like their culture, where they came from, who they are. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. That history is so important, and I think what you gave them was such a gift. Um, and I think mm-hmm. they will think back on it. You know, like <laughs> so. Brandon Shinchi. <laughs> <laughs> thank you <laughs> no thank you awesome well um i think if there if everyone's feeling like pretty complete we can just go into a quick closing of the episode okay yeah it's we're t- topping off pretty close to two hours so oh yeah. wow yeah. wow that's impressive <laughs> but mm-hmm. cool um so i'm going to just go into the closing but Okay. Brandon, um, thank you so much for taking time out of your schedule to talk to us here. I think we learned so much about just your journey and just more about language revitalization. And I'm very thankful for these conversations because they usually stick with me for like weeks after I've talked about mm-hmm. it. And I just kind of keep on going back and stuff like that. But um, if our listeners want to learn more about your work or where they can find you, um, do you have anywhere on social media that you want to plug? Uh, well, if um, if you want to look, if you want to listen to my songs, you can look me up on YouTube. Um, either you can even search my name, Brandon Ing, I N G, um, or you can type in "Let's Sing Uchinaguchi" because um, I have one channel with the the "Let's Sing Uchinaguchi" songs, and then the other channel is more of the um, some of it is not even Okinawa related, but um, then I have my other songs that are are not the 
not geared to be children's songs. <laughs> no. The thing is, there's another Brandon Ng. There's a Brandon Ng who's a tattoo artist that uh, who, who might also pop up if you search Brandon Ng. Uh, yeah, well, that be one, sure but. to leave um, uh, your contact information in the show notes, okay. too. So. <laughs> okay. All right. Yeah. Um, you can also find me on Bandcamp. Um, I think, was it Brandon Ng. Bandcamp. Com? Yeah. So you can listen to my songs there, too. Awesome. awesome. Yeah, thank you so much, Brandon. Just like big uh, for all of your, yeah, all of your energy and what you're putting out into the world. And um, we'll definitely have all of those things posted in our show notes, okay. um, proper links um, so that you can find, find you um, and anything else that we've referenced in this episode. Um, thank you very much. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Bye. Matayasai. <laughs>
Ryujin Mabuya, the movie, Nats no Babui, was released in 2012. Now, to give you all a visual, think Power Rangers or Super Sentai or Kamen Rider superhero vibes. Or you can just check the show notes and watch for yourself. So while the show itself is perhaps a bit dated, it's worth a watch, especially from a local grassroots cultural revitalization perspective. From the native Okinawan landscape to the cultural references such as Mabui stones, the Uchinaguchi speaking Obasan, the Shisa inspired armor, this show definitely entertains. If you do end up watching it, or if you've already seen it and want to share, we'd love to hear your thoughts, reactions, memories, or anything that it evokes for you. And that's it for this episode. We hope you enjoyed. We will see you next month. Mata yasai!